one batting. But people tend to get hurt when that happens.
So it is very interesting uh, to
बोले कल के सर 100 122 जन रजिस्ट्रेशन और एको হচ্ছে কিন্তু একো হচ্ছে প্রচুর যাই না কেন বলতো আমি শান্ত থেকে বলো তো একো হচ্ছে তোমার ভয়েস হ্যাঁ এবার স্যার ঠিক আছে না ঠিক নেই মিশন একো হচ্ছে मानव जयन कर निमायिका सुना जा बंद <laughs> 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 
যেটা আমায় পাঠিয়েছে সেটা ক্লিক করলাম আবার করব লিভ করে করছি দাঁড়ান দেখে নাও বাইরের লোক আছে এখন তো বেরিয়ে আছে কি খুঁজে পাচ্ছ না ব্রায়ান কে হয়ে গেছে জয়েন করেছে হ্যাঁ হ্যাঁ জয়েন করেছে স্যার ওকে দেখা ওকে ই করাব তাহলে আমরা শুরু করব হ্যাঁ স্যার ও তো আমি তো দেখতে পাচ্ছি না শান্তি so that will be lovely because you know i'm sure there are many of my colleagues who are so keen to uh, listen to you and they would like to ask some questions so i'm sure there will be great opportunity to have you in our That's meetings excellent. Ah, and I, 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 i understand that you speak bangla also right ekto ekto bolte pare but but you likhte pare ami likhte pare na likhte likhte pare translate it ha likhte pare porte pare ha so uh, in between if you you know speak in bangla that will be of help to my students some of my students i am not asking you to speak in bangla but you know sir, if you no, no, if you, no. when you talk about vidyasagar from the point of view rabindranath probably you ah. need to quote in bangla also ha ah, nishchoy there bangla is there yeah so i think i'll just you know so once you are ready we can start the uh, ceremony hmm? i'm ready when you are all right okay uh, nimai sir we, we can start so nimai start with the, the rituals Yeah. Brian, you know, mm. hello. Yes. Brian, you know, can, you know, when we perform this, we need to normally stand up. So I request you to stand up, you know, it's a kind of ah. you know, mark of respect. Ah. All right. Yeah. And then.
Okay, Brian, it's done. Uh, Namaskar, Adab, Satsriyakal, and good evening. Friends, it's my great privilege to welcome Professor Brian Hatcher of Tufts University. And I think he doesn't need any introduction because he's too well known in his field. And he's the one who really understood Rabindranath in a real perspective. And we are very happy that when I asked him, that would you like to uh, address my colleagues and my students? And you know, I was so excited that he immediately agreed to address us. And as you know, in Boston, it's 9.30 in the morning. So probably he just had his breakfast and um, he's ready to uh, speak to us. Uh, Brian, we'll, we'll have dinner and you are having breakfast. We are going to have dinner soon. <laughs> um, uh, but still, you know, I must you know, uh, thank you from the core of my heart that you, you agreed, despite being, uh, uh, you know, scheduled in other um, occupations. And recently, Brian, you know, I, I, I just like, I'm happy to let you know that you have got admirers in Vishwa Bharati. Um, a, a colleague of mine he asked me about you. And then I said, okay, let me request. And so this is the kind of, you know, the beginning or the, uh, the background of your lecture today. And in the friends, as you know, I mean, I, I, I know him as a person. I know him through his uh, works. He is the one who is uh, a specialist on uh, Indian political thought, uh, late 19th, um, uh, I mean, 18th, late 18th and early 19th century. And as a student of history, I really was benefited by his uh, two important books. Uh, the first one is, uh, which was published in 2014. The title of the book is Vidyashagar, The Life and Afterlife of an Eminent Indian. I mean, you know, it's a new way of looking at Vidyashagar. Normally, we tend to undertake all kinds of hagiographical studies, you know, full of appreciation. And we try to normally you know, glorify the contribution of uh, Vidyashagar to the level of being a god. But here is a person, here is an author who understood Vidyashagar as a human being and Vidyashagar uh, who contributed immensely not only to uh, Bangla as a, as a language, Bangla uh, as a literature, but also he was a great, great social reformer. And as you know, uh, Rabindranath um, in his uh, Charitra Puja talked about uh, three important Bengalis uh, who inspired him to a significant extent. And of these three, uh, Vindashar happens to be the first one. Then he talked about uh, Ram Mohan Roy. And thirdly, of course, his uh, father, Maharshi Devendranath Tagore. So here is an expert in our midst who dealt with you know, these complex issues um, uh, uh, from the point of view of a historian as also from the point of view of academics. And as I said at the outset, uh, Brian consulted you know, all the original Bangla sources because he's very comfortable in Bangla at least. You know, his uh, writing ability and his reading ability is, you know, is excellent. And he also translated um, uh, one of the texts uh, from Bangla to English. And recently, you know, uh, Brian um, has really become a very, you know, I mean, he's, he's been, Brian's work has been talked about extensively by the scholars all over the world, Hinduism uh, before reform. And uh, friends, I think mm -hmm. I request all of you to read the book because here uh, uh, Brian was talking about um, the contribution of Ramon Roy uh, and Dhanan Saraswati and their contribution to Hinduism. And Hinduism, you know, uh, according to him, is kind of eclectic. Um, kind of religion, uh, which um, uh, evolved uh, through the endeavor of both the great Raja Ram Mohan Roy and great Dhanan Saraswati. I mean, nowadays we, uh, we seem to have forgotten their contribution. We tend to talk about Hinduism with reference to the texts, uh, which are very ancient. But, you know, uh, Brian is the one who really brought, up, brought uh, all those texts which were written in the late 18th and early 19th century, especially by two great giants um, like Ramon Roy and Dhanan Saraswati. So uh, I'm, I'm very happy um, that uh, Professor Hatcher accepted our invitation and agreed to speak um, to us. And uh, with this, I request uh, my colleague Shanto uh, to just you know start the proceedings. Shanto will introduce Brian briefly and then Shanto will conduct the proceedings. And again, I'm happy to let you know that uh, Brian agreed to 
respond to the questions. Mm, that's also very important. So please, you know, if you have any question, uh, send the question in the question bank and uh, Shanto will just, you know, paraphrase some of them. Uh, it depends uh, on the time available to Brian. And uh, let's see, I mean, I'm sure it will be a very exciting session. So Brian, welcome to, we welcome you to Vishwabharati. And now Shanto, please um, uh, uh, start the proceedings. Shanto, do you mind? Welcome to the 24th lecture of the Vishwabharati lecture series, which was begun by Professor Pidut Chakraborty, our vice chancellor, to bring eminent scholars to our campus. The inaugural lecture was delivered by the Cambridge historian, Professor Dilip Chakraborty in January, 2019. We had the privilege to hear many eminent speakers during 2019 and earlier this year. That is still lockdown happened. Post lockdown, the lecture series in its new avatar online has had two lectures so far by Lord Meghnath Desai and Lord Bhikkhu Parikh. Professor Brian Hatcher is a celebrated Indologist as our Vice Chancellor has just referred to him who has studied the life and legacy of Ishwar Chandra Vidyashagar for decades. He is the author of a celebrated monograph, Vidyashagar, The Life and Afterlife of an Eminent Indian. We are honored and proud to have him as our speaker today, as he, in his own words, returns to Shanti Niketan after many decades to join us in celebrating the 200th birth anniversary of Ishwar Chandra Vidyashagar, who was held in very high regard by Gurudev Rabindranath Tagore. It was during his year long stay in Shantiniketan in the 1980s, studying Bangla, that Professor Hatcher began to become aware of the enormous legacy of Ishwar Chandra Bidda Shagur, and began to contemplate a plan for a dissertation on his life and work. I will not stand between you and Professor Hatcher since we are all eager to hear him because of the refreshing points of views that he I'm sure will present before us. And I'm sure all of us will leave this meeting more enlightened about Rabindranath and Ishwar Chandra Vidyashagar. I'll just mention that as a, as a student, Professor Hatcher loved studying chemistry and completed his bachelor's degree in chemistry before going to attend Yale Divinity School. As he says, in some still inquiet way, he wanted to study religion and South Asia and was admitted to the PhD program in the study of religion at Harvard University in 1984. Professor Hatcher is also very well versed in Sanskrit and Bangla. And I was uh, really tickled to know that he has also translated Sharadindu Bandupadhyay, and he himself, as he himself mentions, that while in West Bengal, he discovered the joys of reading Sharadindu by candlelight on humid nights when the power was out and there was little else to do than grab a book and crawl under the mosquito net. It was the perfect way to read Sharadindu up country and in the dark. Lastly, I would also like to welcome perhaps the eldest member of our audience at 93, Dhrubo Narayan Ghosh, who in fact forwarded a viral message to me, uh, which was about Professor Brian Hatcher and then through 
that note, I came to learn about Professor Hatcher. I'm very happy to find him amidst us. And uh, let us now begin the proceedings. Over to you, Professor Brian Hatcher. And thank you so much. Namaskar. Thank you so much. Uh, my greetings to all. Uh, and my sincere thanks for the opportunity to join you this evening. Uh, my morning. Uh, <laughs> thank you to the Vice Chancellor, uh, Vidhu Chakrabarti, for inviting me to speak to you all. Uh, it's a great pleasure to return to Shantaniketan, and I, I thank Shanto Shankar Dashgupta for that wonderful introduction and reminding me of the many happy memories I have of Shantaniketan Vishavarati and my time in India. For, to, for, to, for, this, for this evening, um, I'd like to walk through a PowerPoint presentation that I think will keep some of you engaged. Uh, perhaps if I, if I just lecture to you for 40 minutes, you may find yourselves getting sleepy. So I will give you some images to look at and some text to look at and some text to, so that we can um, think a little bit together about what Rabindranath saw in uh, Vidnashagar. But um, again, my sincere thanks for this opportunity. I wish the, the pandemic were not upon us. I wish I were able to be there in person with you all in uh, Shantaniketan, and I look forward to returning. So let me share my screen with you. And uh, I hope it will. Oh, it says, it says my host has disabled screen sharing. Is it possible for me to, yeah. I have a, a screen share of a PowerPoint. I don't know if Nimai can help with that. Yeah, 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 we can do it. Ah, that, let's see. Hello, participants, share screen. Yeah, it's still, ah, there we go. Is that showing? Yes. You can see that? It's perfect. Excellent. It's perfect. Excellent. And, the, and the, is the sound okay? Yeah, sound is okay. Yes. Very good. I will, I will try to speak a little bit more slowly than I do. Usually I get uh, speaking rather rapidly in, in English. Uh, I'll, I'll attempt to speak some Bangla. As I go along, you'll see there's Bangla text in here. Uh, but my, my Bangla Ucharan has become a bit cut up. So <laughs> uh, you, you bear with me. Um, I'm chose for tonight because we are in Chantanaket and we're thinking both about Rabindranath and we're thinking of the 200th birth anniversary of Vidyashagar. I thought it was a perfect occasion to think about how Rabindranath saw Vidyashagar. And I was reading the text that has already been mentioned by the vice chancellor, the Chartra Pujo, and the essays there written by Rabindranath on Vidyashagar, Ram Mohan, and his own father, Devendranath. Uh, and I thought I would look at that and think about what it was Rabindranath was saying about um, Biddashagar. And here you see on your screen, the Murti of Biddashagar that you find in Karmatar, his retreat in, now in Jharkhand, uh, a memorial there at the house Nandan Kanan that he built for himself in the latter part of his life with an inscription of the famous words from Rabindranath. So it's already been mentioned and I'm delighted to remember that I first came to Bolpur Shantaniketan way back in 1986. It's a long time ago before the internet, uh, before cell phones. It was a really idyllic time. Uh, this was before economic liberalization even. And it was, a, it was a very peaceful, enchanting environment. My wife and I spent a glorious nine months there. Uh, and of course I had come to learn Bangla, but I had also come to learn about Rabindranath uh, my, my admission to Harvard University in the PhD has been mentioned by Shanto Shankar, Shankar and um, it had been my intention that perhaps I would learn Bangla in order to write about Rabindranath. I, I found him to be such a compelling figure, even with the little that I knew about him at that point. So I was fortunate to be admitted to the, to the Bangla program in the foreign casual capacity at Vishwabharati and delightedly came there 
expecting to learn about Rabindranath and learned so much about him, of course. But along the way, I encountered unexpectedly the figure of Biddashagar. And I'm showing you the cover of a, of a paperback version of Barnapuri Choi that I purchased in a bookstore in Bolpur uh, one afternoon when I cycled into town to buy some doi. Uh, uh, this book, this little book has, has done for so many and even did for Rabindranath, changed my life um, because I realized there was someone here about whom the West and America in particular knew next to nothing, but yet was a, a figure of enormous importance in Bengal and in India generally. And this image of him with the radiant nimbus behind him, radiating energy, uh, struck me as a sign to me that this man needed to be known more fully by scholars uh, in my own field of South Asian studies. And so I did a bit of a turn and decided I would take up the study of Vidashagar. And it always struck me that that would be useful for eventually becoming more acquainted with Rabindranath because of course Rabindranath looked back to Vidashagar in so many important ways. So I thought if you were going to understand Rabindranath, you needed to understand Vidashagar who preceded him. But together the two struck me as offering very important ways to think about some of the issues I put on the screen for you here. How can we understand what it means to be Bengali in the modern period? How does modern Bengali identity take shape? What has been the role of figures like Ram Mohan, Bindashagar, Rabindranath in shaping that identity? That makes us think of the Bangla Jagaran, the Bengal Renaissance and the narratives uh, that have been told about the awakening of India in the 19th century. How are we to understand the period of British imperialism, colonialism, the arise, rising of new sentiments of national patriotism amongst Indians and the quest to discover the beauty, truth and significance of their own traditions. Then that brings me to the third point. How did tradition take on a new life in the colonial period and for me, these two figures of Bindashagar and Tagore are among the most compelling for taking elements of ancient Indian tradition, the Shastras, the Upanishads, the narratives of the epics, the literature of Kalidasa, and reshaping them, repurposing them, retooling them for the purposes of a modern moment. And so here too, we think of the intersection of literature, religion, and the regional identity of Bengalis as these have all shaped modern Indian history. Um, I was prompted to write something recently, maybe some of you had seen or heard uh, Prime Minister Modi's address inaugurating Durga Puja when he suggested that Bengal had always led the way when it came to progress in India. And of course, this is a theme we know quite well. And we think of the, the forerunners of Ramohan, Bidashagar, Vivekananda, Ramkrishna Tagore, et cetera. Um, and it's hard not to think about the significance of Bengal in pointing the way towards uh, contemporary modernity, even if in my most recent book that's been so kindly mentioned, Hinduism Before Reform, I'm also beginning to try to think of other ways to tell the story of modern Hinduism. But that's a story for another day. So in Bidashagar and Rabindranath, I found uh, a fruitful dialogue, you can say. I, uh, the texts, the, the lives, the legacies of these two figures have for me been a constant kind of companion throughout my professional career. Uh, I've written, of course, two books on Bidashagar. I've yet to write a book on Rabindranath. I, I still feel humbled before the majesty of Tagore. Uh, just looking at Rachanabali, I think I remember going to Bishavarati Central Library when I arrived and looking for the Rachanabali and finding it on the shelves and realizing it comprised so many volumes. And I was only just learning Bangla and I thought, how will I ever tackle the man who could write so much literature, poetry, drama, fiction, uh, philosophy, you name it. So I settled on Bindashagar who only has three volumes of Rachanabali, which is considerable in its own right. But if you were to visit my office at Tufts University today, you would find shelves of books by Tagore uh, and about Tagore uh, paired with 
uh, an image I had painted for me by a, a, a Potua from uh, um, uh, Mednipur um, of Vidashagar. And my books on Vidashagar are on another shelf, but you see here the pairing and the ongoing presence of the two men in my own personal and professional life. To go even more personal for a moment, the book I eventually wrote as first as my dissertation at Harvard, which became my first book from Oxford University Press, in, which was then still in Kolkata, which was then still called Calcutta in 1996, Idioms of Improvement, Bidashagar and Cultural Encounter in Bengal. If you know the book, you know I inscribed it to my wife uh, in gratitude, and I used a passage from Tagore's poem, Prem, Shundar Hridi Ranjan Tumi Nandan Fulohar, Tumi Ananta Navabashanta Antare Amar. I thought that was just a beautiful line, both lyrically and, and in terms of meaning. And it spoke to me in terms of the, the joy that my wife brings me. But here you see Bidashagor and Tagore paired, even in my first uh, scholarly production. I wanted to use this as an occasion to direct your attention to the fact that a new edition revised and uh, with a new preface is due out any day from Primus Books in New Delhi. Same title, same familiar uh, contents, slightly updated and, and revised. But I, I'm eager for you all to see it. Uh, I hope it will be out soon. I was told it would be out by Diwali. I've not seen a copy yet, but please do look for it. Uh, I think it still has, um, has significance. And of course, I was delighted it could appear on the 200th anniversary of Bindash Agor's birth. So then to my, to my question for today, what did Tagore see in Bindash Agor? And I was fortunate to be able to find two monumental statues of these men, Bindash Agor at Bindash Agor University in Midnapur and Rabindranath at Rabindra Sharabar in Kolkata. Um, and delightfully, we see Rabindranath gazing over at the imposing figure of Bindashagar. And we have to ask ourselves, what was it that Rabindranath saw in this man who was in so many respects unlike him, just in terms of his style and his uh, cultural habits? Well, I'll, I'll skip right to the point because in Bindashagar Charit, uh, uh, Charitra, uh, Rabindranath tells us what he saw in Bindashagar was a Bidrohi, a Bidrohi, a rebel. And in my own translation, he says, Bindashagar was like a rebel without an army who marches fearlessly forward on the battlefield of life, carrying all alone the flag of victory on his shoulder. He called to no one for help and he found no one by his side. He just kept marching forward unrestrained. So we have a, an image here of a solitary hero up against the world in the posture of rebellion. And I think we're familiar with this posture. We're familiar with this gaze. We're familiar with this um, imagery of Bindashagar. But I would pause one moment and ask, in what respects was this Sanskrit trained Brahmin pundit really a rebel? Does it make sense to think of him as a rebel? Um, I'm, I'm being deliberately provocative here just to ask the counterfactual, does it, does it make sense to call him a rebel? After all, uh, there are many people who would look at an image of Bidzao Shagor such as we see here in College Square in Kolkata and say he is a disciplinarian. He was a figure of authority. He was a rather imposing uh, disciplinarian. This is the man who wrote Niti Bodh. And in Niti Bodh, you have instructions about obedience on the part of servants towards their masters. Right? This is the man who was, of course, principal of Sanskrit College, who imposed new modes of discipline there, but who also was reluctant to open the school to certain social classes who we felt had not risen to the level of respectability. Does that sound like a rebel? And of course, even Rabindranath understood that this is the author of Barnapuri Choi with its praise for the Subodh 
Gopal, the dutiful and well-mannered young boy who was opposed to the Rakal, the disobedient and re rebellious young boy. So in what respect was Vidashaga really a rebel? Was he not perhaps more conservative and conforming? What was his rebellion? If rebellion is about insurrection, disobedience, it's worth pausing to think about this word vidroha. We can go back to the Monier Williams Sanskrit English Dictionary. We know the root meaning comes from dru, the root dru, which gives us droha. And droha is plotting against, seeking to hurt, to assail, to cause injury. It's treachery. Droha is wrong. Droha is rebellion. These are powerful words. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna contrasts Mitra with Droha. These are opposites, friendship and treachery. And in an 1828 Bengali dictionary from the early colonial period, Vidroha is defined as the desire to do harm, Hinsecha, Doisha, malevolence, malice, spite, persecution. It's a powerful words to associate with a concept like Vidroha. Even Rabindranath's father, Debendranath, used the concept when thinking about the 1857 rebellion. It was a Raj Bidroha, a rebellion against the government. So I'm just asking, does any of that sound like the Dashagar? Malevolence, malice, insurrection, rebellion? It's hard to wonder, but this is what um, poets do. Poets help us rethink the world through language. And um, Rabindranath is directing us to think of Bindashagar, perhaps in new ways. Well, we can pause and ask, was he a rebel against the government? He worked with the government. He asked the British government to assist him with the Bidoba Bibaho campaign. So here you see the title page of his first tract, Bidoba Bibaho Prachalatahawa Uchitkina, uh, in which he argues for the possibility of widow marriage. We, we, we're accustomed to think of him as a reformer, but reformers are not revolutionaries. Reformers, we don't think of as ushering in rebellions that will topple the existing structures. They simply work to change the structures that exist to make them more equitable, perhaps. So then Rabindranath again, what was it he was seeing that led him to use this word vidrohi? And what would Vidashagar's rebellion consists of? Well, in his own uh, essay from Charitra Puja, he speaks about Vidashagar's own life narrative as Vidashagar wrote it, published after he passed away by his son Narayan Chandra, Vidashagar uh, Charito, Swarachito. In that narrative, Vidashagar famously tells us about his grandfather, Ramjoy Tarkabushan. And Ramjoy was a phenomenal figure, a man of indomitable will and fiery tejas, the man who would disappear suddenly from his village, go away on pilgrimage, the man who would curse the rest of the villagers in his area saying there wasn't a man amongst them. This was a rebel. This is what, this is what Rabindranath saw glimmerings of in Vidashagar himself, a remarkable individual. And of course, Rabindranath saw Vidashagar himself as the man who, though he worked for the government for several years and achieved great things as principal of the Sanskrit College and as a uh, sub-inspector sub for uh, schools in South Bengal, eventually resigned in frustration over the government's posture around vernacular education, feeling a sense of betrayal and who famously said he would rather sell alu pato in the marketplace than work under such conditions. There's the instincts perhaps of individualism, of rebellion, of um, integrity, we might say. These are the things that sparked Rabindranath's admiration. The spirit of individualism, the willingness to risk everything for something higher, if you read Religion of Man, if you read Vidashagar's Jibon Shritti, uh, 
you see him again and again talking about the spirit of life and how the spirit of life is itself rebellious. Amader pran bidrohi. We are very life forces rebellious. The spirit of life rebels against constriction, rebels against being walled in, hemmed in by the rules of society. And Bindasha, I mean, Rabindranath is constantly teasing us, tempting us, calling us to go beyond the restrictions of society, to take risks. So he has a poem in Bangla, Bidrohi, but he also has this poem from his collection, Fugitive in which he says, for once, be careless, timid traveler, and utterly lose your way. Wide awake though you are, be like broad daylight enticed by and netted in the midst, in the mist. So for once, take a risk, he's saying, for once, rebel. And I think this is the, the way in which we have to think about Bidashagar in Ravindranath's mind. He was, perhaps the man who looked like a timid traveler, a, a dutiful servant of the government uh, who turned out to be a solitary hero. This is what you find in Charitra Puja. There, of course, you all know he praises Bidda Shagar's Akkoi Manushata and for being the Adi Kobi of the Bangla language when he read those famous lines from uh, Barnapuri Choi and, and heard the echoes of the music of language, crediting, here's the greatest poet of modern Bengal, crediting Vidashagar with awakening his poetic sensibility. This is a powerful thought in its own right. But in his essay on Vidashagar, he also borrows from the, the Brahmo writer Shibnath Shastri, who had said Vidashagar lived by a life of manana, reflection. And I think this is interesting because um, Bidashaga was not a philosopher. We don't think of him as issuing spiritual discourses or indulging in argument for the sake of proving certain things at a philosophical level. So what, when Rabindranath says Bidashaga lived in reflection, what does he mean? What does this reflection consist of and how does it relate to rebellion? I want to propose that we can find some hint about this when we look at Bidogod Babaho in particular. This has been an important text for me to understand uh, Bindashagar. Because as I see it, if you, if you set aside the lengthy discussions of Dharma Shastra, the quotations from the various Shastras around uh, issues of Paunar Baba and issues of the Kali Varjas and the various rules and regulations around the Kali Yuga. What you really get to at the core of the text is Vidashagar is asking Bengalis to see the world in a different way. Ha Bharat Varshio Manavgon Ar Kotokal Tomra Moha Nidrai Abibut Hawa Pramod Shajai Shayan Korea Tagbe Ekbar Gyan Chakku Un Milan Korea Deko. Right? Just for once open up the mind's eye and see what's right in front of you. So he's saying, please look at the world and see what I see. In Bidoba Vivaho, he's telling his fellow Bengalis, you're deluded. You're asleep in delusion, moha nidra. You need to see things as they really are. This is the kind of life of reflection, I think, that struck both Shibnat Shastri and Bindashava. Consider in English, alas, people of India, for how much longer will you lay prostrate on a bed of delusion? Right? And here I, I wanted to put up the title of uh, title page or cover of my translation of Bidova Bibaho because I think for all, again, it's a difficult work to read. It was a difficult work to translate because of all the Sanskrit uh, discussion around Dharma Shastra. But when you get right down to it, it's a fundamentally important work for understanding Vidashagar's vision of the world. As he says in the Uposhanghar, the conclusion to the second tract, anyone with eyes and ears will acknowledge 
Chakku Karna Vishishta Vyakti Matrei Shikar Korven. Anyone, everyone, any person who has eyes and ears has to acknowledge the facts of the suffering and pain experienced by young child widows who have been abandoned in the world and left with no support. He's calling out in a, we think of it as a doya shagar and compassion, but he's also trying to get us to see the world differently. And of course, he, he had done something like this already in his first reform tract, Bala Bebahya Dosh, where he's talking about the problem of child marriage, and giving away uh, eight-year-olds in marriage. And he talks here, too, about being deluded by mirages, Fala Mruga Trishnai, right? Being compelled by mirages, deluded, Mugda, right? But everyone, Manusha Matrei, everyone is confused by this, such that they don't see what happens when you start marrying children at a young age. This is something everyone should understand. Now, as I said, Vidalivaho requires Vidashagar to demonstrate his mastery of Dharma Shastra. And of course, that mastery is on display. If you read Vidalivaho part one and part two, you've read something like 200 quotations from Manu, Yagyavalkya, uh, Baudayana, etc. You've heard Vidashagar comment on these Shastras. You've seen him tackle the arguments between the Shastrakaras about the meaning of various rituals and vidhis. But Vidashagar was not bound by the Shastra as much as he was motivated or uh, empowered by them. And I think Rabindranath appreciated this. He knew that Vidashagar was not a Shampradayak man. His reading of the Shastras was not Shampradayak. It was reasoned, reflective, and driven by this desire to get um, the society to see the world in a new way. In that respect, Vidashagar was not Gata no Gatika. Rabindranath quotes from the Panchatantra in contrasting someone who's Gata no Gatika is a traditionalist, someone who just goes along to get along the way things have been done ever and always. No, he was not that sort of person. He was Paramartika. He had his vision set on higher things, on the highest things, Paramartha. And that meant he had to think for himself in terms of those higher values. It made him one of a kind, you could say. And it issued into rebellion. I think you can take this and then go back and read his uh, short text on biography, Jiban Charito, and realize the importance of the quotations you find there, or quote, excuse me, the biographical sketches you find of Copernicus and Galileo, two great early modern scientists who dared to rebel against the authority of the Catholic Church. In Copernicus's time, Midda Sagar said, Tatkaling Logdegere Riticilo, Purba Charger, Jahad Nadesh Korea this is the way it was when Copernicus lived. This was an era of kusangskar. Kusangskar. What does this word mean? Well, Bindashagar knew he was paving new ground, so in Jivan Charito he provides a glossary of Bangla terms with their English equivalents. And it's fascinating to see that for kusangskar he chose the English word prejudice as the best translation. And then he defined it. Prejudice is reaching conclusions that are not based on careful consideration. There's a summary of reflection, if you will. That's what Shibnath Shastri and Rabindranath himself understood by the concept of living by reflection. It's not reaching conclusions that are haven't been based on careful consideration. This is what made Copernicus and Galileo, the eminent scientists they were, but also meant they had to rebel against the systems that were constraining the free flow of scientific learning. 
this is how Vidyashagar was, and this is what Rabindranath saw. He was his own man, we would say. And that independence, that Swadinata, that's none other than Nijitva. That's his self-possession. That constitutes Vidyashagar's absolute autonomy. Right? To be a rebel is to be answerable to oneself alone. Right? It's to have that Nijitva, self-possession. So I've thought about this in terms of the moral project that Vidyashagar was engaged in. It was rebellion. We can romanticize the rebellion, but we can also think about that rebellion as aimed at transforming society. And I borrow from the feminist scholar and philosopher, Nancy Frazier, who's written a lot about the problems of institu institutionalized gender inequity. And if we think about what Vidyashagar was doing for the Bengali woman in his day, to the best of his ability, his rebellion rejected what Frazier would call institutionalized patterns of cultural value that would work to constitute some actors as inferior, excluded, or simply invisible. And I think the invisible part is important in terms of Vidhava Vibaho. He's telling us, that people don't see what's right in front of them. They don't see the suffering of the Bengali woman. They have, the woman has become invisible. So his rebellion asks Bengalis to acknowledge that in so far as they fail to recognize women as full partners in social interaction, they were guilty of perpetuating status subordination. They were perpetuating the subordination of women within society. And this was something he felt was insupportable. So he called uh, for a recognition, if you will. Rabindranath saw this and he saw the special regard. And this, of course, has become legendary about Vidyashagar, the regard he held for women. Um, and Rabindranath called out and said this was a matter of shame. And Perhaps he, he draws on a bit of a colonial stereotype, but he says this is partly what's led to the weakness of the Bengali is that we've not done right by our women. Well, taking up this attitude caused, of course, Bidashagar to be thrust into the flames of controversy. Um, and I put this image, which is the cover art for the translation of Hindu widow marriage here, because I asked an artist that I knew at that time to give me a rendering of Vidyashagar. And the one thing he, he didn't know much about South Asia or Bengal, but he did understand the controversy around Nashte Mirti Pravarajite, excuse me, that the shloka from Parashara, he understood what Vidyashagar tried to do. And so I thought it was compelling that he inserted Vidyashagar in a kind of a flaming chalice here to suggest the controversy around this rebellion. And I find it interesting that Vidyashagar himself understood what his own mode of rebellion was. If you read, and I don't know that many people read them anymore, but the, the tracks on Bidava Vivaho, Bahu Vivaho, and the pseudonymous tracks in particular, this is one of them, Braj Bilas, which Vidyashagar wrote under an assumed name, attacking his opponent Brajnath Vidyaratna, therefore it's called Braj Bilas. Um, Vidyashagar using some rather uncharacteristically direct language, but it's very clearly his voice. And here he's imagining someone else speaking about Vidyashagar. And he says, Dukkar bishoy e amra shadin jati nei, shadin hoi le, etto din kono kale Vidyashagar babaji sa shorire shaga rohan kortem. Karon shadin shadu samajer teji an chai mahodaya right? humorously writing about himself and he says it's a shame we're not an independent nation if we were Mr. Vidyashagar would have departed for heaven some time ago because the brilliant worthies of independent society of the good, Sadhu Samaj, 
would never have stooped at such misconduct. They would have called him a rebel and brought his case before the court. So Bindash Agar himself had some sense that what he was doing was viewed as a kind of rebellion. And even here, because we know how angry and how potent were the opponents who attacked him on this issue, maybe people actually did view his rebellion as malevolent, as malicious, as insurgent, because after all, in this respect, he was threatening to change long-standing custom in Bengal. So perhaps Bidashagar himself can be trusted to understand that at least from the other side, what he was doing looked like a kind of malevolent form of insurgency, a mutiny even against uh, the status quo. This seems to have struck Rabindranath quite powerfully. For me, this rebellion that seeks to get Bengalis to recognize prejudice was a, is a kind of a red thread that runs through Vidnashagar's, um, all his work. And so I, I call attention to it because it now gives you a way to go back and read so much of what he wrote in other contexts and think about it in terms of the particular kind of rebellion he was engaged in. So go back again and read the Vidnashagar again, those same stories in which we we read about Ramjoy Tarkabushan. We also have the famous story of his father, Takodas, be, becoming uh, assisted by a kind widow. And you have the famous lines from Vidash over there saying, when he heard this heart-rending story, it kindled an unbearable blaze of sorrow in my heart. Matched in intensity only by the profound respect for women, it engendered in me. So you can say that in that moment, when he heard that story from his father, he recognized the Bengali woman in a way perhaps others had not. That act of recognition, I, in one of my writings, I call it the Shakuntala paradigm because Vidashagar also, of course, loved the story of Shakuntala from Kalidasa, originally from the Mahabharata, of course. And we know the story of Shakuntala falling in love with Tushanta um, and having his child, but being abandoned by him. So we have a story of love, forgetfulness caused by the curse of the sage, then ultimately an act of recognition when the king's memory is cleared and he remembers Shakuntala and finally restoration. So I think in some sense, I call this a paradigmatic kind of movement that Biddashagar valued where love would be restored through acts of recognition. And I find the, the theme of recognition or the failure to recognize people to be really prominent in other works like Bhranti Bilash and Shitar Banabash. Bhranti Bilash, of course, is all about the confusion of identity. We have sets of doubles moving about and people don't know which one is which. So that's clearly an entire play by Shakespeare that Bidashaga decides has something to do with recognition and its failure. And then of course, Sitar Banalash also has the, 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 the heart stirring plight of Sita and her abandonment by Rama. And why doesn't he recognize her for who she really is? So this theme can be, I think, found running through Bidashagar's work. And I think it's something Rabindranath valued quite profoundly. The thing that Tagore, of course, was able to do because he was such a poetic genius was to reformulate language and, and help us see things in new ways. So when he says that Dashaka was Paramartic, one might think, well, if he was Paramartic, then he was like a sannyasi or a, a sage who dwelt in the transcendent and who was always off in meditative bliss and was so completely superior to us that he didn't share anything with us. But of course, this is not what Tagore is saying. He says at one and the same time, Bindashaga was Paramartic, but he was also completely one of us. So he was absolutely unique. He had his Nijatwa, but his very Nijatwa was also part of his Manushata, his humanity. I think, and here we are on the 200th anniversary, of Bidashagar's birth, 
that if we think of the, the moments of commemoration when we return to thinking about the significance of figures who, with whom we've lived quite familiarly, and I say this, uh, I'm not a Bengali, but I know Bengalis know Bidashagar because he's one of them. There's a moment when we need to try to appreciate them anew, to find new ways to think about them. And this is what Tagore sought to show by giving us a way to say Bidashagar was both so clearly paramarthic and, and unique, sui generis, but then he was also absolutely one of us, together with us, a human being struggling with the same things that we struggle with. I think this is then finally to the title of my talk, why Rabindranath says that Dashaka was twice alive, really, two times alive. And he was making a pun here uh, because of course, Bidashaga was a Duja. He was a Brahmin, a twice born. But that's by no means to say anything unique about Bidashaga. In fact, if you just called him a Duja or a Brahmin, you would just be slotting him into a kind of traditional status. That would be to make him just Gatanugatika, just traditional, ordinary, run of the mill, nothing unusual. But that of course wasn't Bidashagar. And here's that painting that I asked the Patuva to, to uh, do for me in which he chose to depict that moving scene from Bidashagar's life story when he's supposedly reading his school books under the light of the street lamp. And then next to him is Goddess Saraswati, of course, bringing him the learning that will make him um, world conquering, if you will. The Dasha was not just Dvija, he was Dvigun Jivita, he was two times alive. He is a Brahmin Pandit, but he took that status and used his skills to recognize others and to improve the world. I'm struck. Um, and at the 200th anniversary, uh, seminar that was held at Asiatic Society in Kolkata in 2019, in September, kicking off the year of celebrations, which I was pleased to attend and was honored to give the keynote address at. One of the themes that emerged was the immense affection that people have for Bindashagra at the most popular levels. People may not know all the greats the Bankim Chandras and the Akoi Kumar Dattas and the Devendranaths, they may not be able to tell you much about them. But when I did my original research on Vidasha, it struck me that almost anyone I met, from a shopkeeper to a taxiwala, to a school teacher, to a businessman, to a government official, everyone knew Vidasha and had a story to tell about him. And their stories were stories often refracted through the wisdom of Rabindranath that had to do with Vidnashagar's incredible heroism, his rebellion against constriction and constraint. And it just, it continues to amaze me how this Brahmin Pandit who should be the most different from many Bengalis that you could possibly be, the man who insisted on wearing the dhoti chador who never changed his style to look like a moderner, if you will. And, Bidash, and Rabindranath points this out. He didn't follow after the fashions of colonial uh, dress. He remained utterly himself, but that self was also a, a Brahmin pundit from the village, which trained as a scholar. And so maybe you would think people would know nothing about this man. And yet he remains widely loved and respected. And the photo here of the image that was installed in a refugee colony, the Bindashagar colony in South Calcutta, taken by a young colleague of mine, James Bradbury, who works in this colony, um, struck me that these are refugees settling in a new city, people often on the margins of power, uh, on the margins of socioeconomics, 
status and success. And who do they look to as an icon? The Dashavar. Because he must stand for all those things that they think deserves recognition. And they themselves crave to be recognized. And that strikes me as a, a wonderful theme to, to hold in mind as we celebrate his 200th anniversary. Because as Rabindranath tell us, tells us, that constitutes his undying humanity, the Dashavar's Akkoi Manushata. He was utterly unique in so many ways. He'll never be um, matched, but at the same time, absolutely one of us. This painting is on the wall in the Karmatar railway station in Jharkhand, um, where Vidyashagar settled late in life, um, a place where he famously was feeling most at home with the tribal community, the Santalis. Uh, how did this Brahmin Pandit manage to find himself comfortable there? How did the Santali people, who would have ordinarily probably been suspicious of another Brahmin Bengali coming and settling amidst them, but why did they welcome him? Why did they come to cherish him in their community? Because of his humanity, I think, because he proved to be one of them, even as he was so clearly remarkably unique at the same time. I think that pairing is something Rabindranath saw and as a poet who was fond of tensions between freedom and bondage, light and dark, heaven and earth, love and anger. He understood how contrasts cohere. He understood that Vidyashagra could be at one and the same time, utterly unique and completely universal. So on that note, I'll conclude by returning to the image at Nandan Kanan in Karmatar, erected in Vidyashagra's memory and carrying the famous words of Rabindranath about his Ajaya Parushata and his Akkoya Manushata. And I'll just say, long live Vidyashagra. Thank you. I hope that uh, I've made some sense and I'd be happy to take some questions from all of you. Anto, question group, Pecho, you have a few questions. There are a few questions. There are a few questions. To begin with, uh, Sir, actor Prashna Chigo, sir. Shanto? Yes, sir. Uh, the, first, the, one? the first question is from Ananda Dr. Gupta. And he says, I'm intrigued by this idea that you attribute to Vidya Shagur that Tagore also acknowledges, namely, fellow human suffering as an empirical fact, as a matter of bare seeing with one's eyes. Mm -hmm. Something accessible only to the effect. This is what defines the reformist approach. I didn't, I'm not sure I heard the whole question. Uh, I'll say that again. Yes. I am intrigued by this idea that you attribute to Vidyashagar that mm. Tagore also acknowledges, namely, fellow humans suffering as an empirical fact, mm. a matter of bare seeing with one's eye. Mm. rather than as something accessible only through the effect. Do you think this is what defines the reformist approach? I do think it's, it, if it's not definitive of it, it's one essential component of it. I think the reformer is um, dissatisfied with the present. Uh, and that dissatisfaction in part arises out of a sense of 
uh, awareness of imbalance and injustice. And part of that is promoted by the, uh, the perception of suffering. So yes, I do think it's an important part of the posture of a reformer. The more goes into what we think of as a reformer in terms of their approach to uh, how change will be affected. Will it be done, say, the revolutionary may say, let's violently overthrow the power structures, whereas the reformer says, let's take this knowledge we have, let's pair it with institutional structures that may already be existing. And so in this case, this is what I think has led some over the, over the decades to question whether Bidashaga was too close to the colonial government in the sense that why would he work so closely with uh, the British to pass laws changing uh, Hindu custom instead of working within the Hindu community uh, to, to affect change naturally that way. Was he somehow, you know, in the, in the 70s, he was called a comprador, that somehow he also made some money by selling books, textbooks and things by working with the government. So there, his reformist impulse was that these are the structures of power as they exist now, let's use them to improve the world. That's why I called my first book, Idioms of Improvement, because it's a it's a gesture not to overthrow the world, but to simply make it better progressively. And I think that's characteristic of a reformer. I don't know if, I, if I'm answering the question. Well, next question is from Shashato Bhattacharya. Sir, can you please mention about Bidashagar's ideas about casteism and untouchability greatly mm. prevailing in the contemporary society and how it was seen by Tagore and other prominent personalities like Keshav Chandra Shen. And he also goes on to ask, and what mm. kind of relation was there between Keshav Chandra Shen, contemporary Brahmo leaders, and Vitashavar? Yes, that's a, that's a very rich and uh, complicated question. Um, Vitashavar's attitudes on casteism, I think, here again, I think from one vantage point, as I said early in my talk, it doesn't look like he was very rebellious. Uh, he was a Brahmin. He enjoyed the status and the prerogatives of a Brahmin, the respect and entitlement, the adhikara, if you will, that comes with being a Brahmin. And I don't think that ever served him ill. Um, but he also, to his credit, gradually worked again in, the, in a reformist mode, a gradual mode to open up the Sanskrit college to non-Brahmin students. But this was a work that took time and it was not a work that ever fully included the lowest of the Shudra castes and it never really addressed the question of untouchability. I don't believe we have uh, evidence as to Bindashagar's particular views on the problem of, of what we would call the Dalit predicament today. Uh, we may not be able to use him in this respect to think about this problem, uh, we may need to come up with the new solutions to the, to the question of this radical uh, structural injustice that's built into the caste system. He doesn't help us with that, I don't think. Uh, it's not necessarily a fault, but it's just simply a limitation of what we know about his own mind and the, the sorts of things he left us by way of um, published writings. So there we have a bit of a limit. Then the question was about Keshav Chandrasen. Um, you know, Bhattacharya, I think he, he was like an uncle uh, and a big brother to so many of these younger figures. Shivnath, of course, Shivnath Shastri, Keshav. Um, yeah, so many people came to him, sought his blessing, uh, found support from him, but I think also were at times frustrated by him. Uh, I think even Rabindranath talks about asking um, Bidashagar to join a society they were proposing. And Bidashagar says, oh, just leave me out of it. It won't come to anything anyway. If you get us involved, meaning us older uh, elite uh, social leaders, it won't, you'll just get a bunch of arguing. And Rabindranath says, you know, in the end, he was right. Um, but at the same time, there was, a, there was a kind of a pessimism that crept into Bidashagar about some of his own I think some of his own goals. Uh, this is the argument that I find so compelling from Ashok Shen in his book, Vidashagar and his Elusive Milestones, uh, that there were some ways in which eventually his own dreams of improving society ran into the, uh, 
hard reality of a colonial economy and a colonial political structure that was not going to allow change. So um, the, the, the person who posed the question may know better than I do uh, particulars about Keshub's relationship with uh, Bidashar, but it's not something I've looked into in any detail. So I'm, I, I won't risk any co comments further on that. The next question, why Vidashavar went to Karmatar and lived about 17 years with the Santans? Hmm. Yes, a wonderful question. Uh, I begin the book that uh, the Vice Chancellor so very kindly called attention to, as did Santosh Shankar. You've, you've also called attention to it, the Vidashavar life and afterlife of an eminent Indian. I begin the book in Karmatar. So I, I begin my study of his life at the end of his life, if you will, because I think it's one of the more compelling questions. Why did a man we associate with all that was great about social change in colonial Calcutta end up retreating to uh, the Santal Park, what was then the Santal Parganas, uh, so remote, uh, so disconnected. Of course, he had Bidashagar had serious health, con health issues throughout his latter life. Throughout most of his life, he suffered from terrible dysentery. And he was, you know, eventually to die from uh, liver disease, I believe. So he had ongoing chronic issues that required him sometimes to go to Chandanagar and places to recoup his health. So there, there may have been simply reasons for change of air, clean water, clean air. But he was also in my estimation, increasingly frustrated with what was happening in the 1880s, 1870s, 1880s, uh, in terms of social change, the, the resistance towards his own efforts in Bahu Vivaho. These campaigns were incredibly um, acrimonious. Uh, and he, he, as I write about in the book, even long time trusted friends and colleagues like Taranath Tarkavachaspati, his pundit colleague who had helped him with Bidova Bivaho, ended up turning on him and becoming his opponent. And these things frustrated him, I think. Uh, he had frustrations with his own family. Um, so there's a sadness to Bidashagor, I think, that perhaps Rabindranath would tell us that's also what makes him human. Uh, he's profoundly disenchanted and somewhat broken by the end of his life, I think. Uh, that's my interpretation. The next question comes, uh, come Uh, do you think Vidashavar was a little disappointed during his last period of life for not to not include spiritualism in his core concept of improvement of human character? The same we see in Gurudev from the beginning in form of practice of Upanishad and Srimad Bhagavad Gita. Yeah. That's a, that's a really wonderful question. Uh, and it's one of the persistent, it, it's part of a larger persistent question about Bidashavar, this whole Bidashavar ki Nastik Chilan. Uh, you know, was he a Nastikal? Was he opposed to religion? Um, or was he somehow a, a secularist uh, in, a, in a time when secularism was only just beginning to, to be understood as a possibility, as a sort of political and, and religious posture. Um, it's, I, I've always wondered, uh, given the importance of the Upanishads for Ramohan and, and Bindashagar's clear uh, in, indebtedness to Ramohan for the issues of reform and for uh, awareness of what a Brahmin intellectual could do in the colonial moment, why Bindashagar studiously never, never, to my mind, ever quotes the Upanishads. Mahabharata, he he quotes occasionally. He knows the stories from the Mahabharata. Upanishads, Bhagavad Gita, though, he, he just doesn't resonate with him. Why, why is that? Um, it's a very good question. We can't, again, plumb 
the internals of his psyche. Um, but it, it was, was he less well off for that, not having that spiritual dimension? Was that part of his, his malaise toward the end of his life? Again, I don't know. I, 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 I feel there was some disappointment in his latter life, but I don't know. He was also very disappointed with religious leaders. So I think he was utterly suspect of people who claim to know the path to heaven. He just, he just did not have that, sh that gene in him, we might say today. He just didn't have the God gene. <laughs> the next question, how did Vidashagar's casteism affect his relations with the Tantats? It's a good question too. And I, I think I allude to this in the, in the book uh, by way of saying that there's clearly a bit of Brahmanical paternalism, I think, that he could trade on, whether he was fully aware of it or not. But of course, here he came uh, an, an elite. Uh, he had a great deal of wealth by this time. You know, he had built his wonderful house in Badurbagan, beautiful, beautiful place, wonderful library, furnitures, all kinds of things that marked him as a a rather successful Bhadralok, you might say. So he had immense resources. He could come to uh, Karmatar, build a home for himself and a dispensary. So he could afford to set up a free clinic and treat the Santas. So there's a bit of Mabap kind of thing in there where he could be the big man who could dispense largesse. But if we were to believe the stories, and some of them are quite humorous if you read Hara Prashad Shastri's account of visiting the Dashagun Karmatar and the humorous ways in which the Santalis almost took advantage of Bidashagar by way of asking him to give them something and then uh, Bidashagar would give that to them and then they would come back and sell it back to him so that he would give them money. I mean, they, Hara Prashad makes us realize that Bidashagar did this almost with a wink that he understood that they were having some fun with him and taking advantage of him. But so there's, it's, it's a bit of a both end question. I think he, he was clearly able to be uh, trade on his status as an elite Brahmin, uh, taking care of the poor uh, tribal people. At the same time, he seems to have an, a, a core affection for them and to have a, a sense of common humanity, I think, shared humanity. And, and we have to believe that their suffering and illnesses did trouble him or why would he have bothered to dispense medicines and, and display such care for them? The next question comes from Bhaskar Bhosh. Why did Dashagar fail to educate his own wife, Dinobongi Devi? Only because he did not want to go against his mother's stereotyped ideas? Again, these are the, these are the such pressing questions and the, the moments where we want to say that our, our heroes have clay feet. Um, it's, it's one of those um, regrettable things, hard for us to understand. And in, and in terms of the argument I've just made about recognizing the plight of the Bengali woman, why in his public work, uh, Bidashagar could be so attentive to the, to the suffering and um, status subordination of the Bengali woman and the widow in particular, and yet not help his wife uh, become literate. Um, again, these are one of those imponderable questions that we just don't know what we can, we could speculate, we could generate arguments as to why that was, but um, it may, I don't think it's as simple as, you know, acceding to his mother's wishes uh, his own wife may not have wished in a, in a kind of vigorous way to be involved in this kind of progress. You know, it's deep-seated notions of what, what makes one fit into society and what makes one's life have meaning can be difficult to uproot even in one's loved ones. I mean, we struggle in our own families at times uh, to get people to, to see things differently than how they've come to see them, even our own mothers and brothers. And so... Um, I don't think he, again, he wasn't unique in that regard. Amrit Sen asks, Tagore praises in Charitra Puja Vidashago's contribution to language. Both of them sought to write 
primers in the Bengali language. Mm. You see this also within the theme of reform in your talk. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't, I strayed away from the language theme because in some ways I felt that's quite familiar. Uh, it's also a slightly different tangent to take, but that is an important element in the Charitra Puja essays around Bindashagar, this whole idea of him being the Adi Kobi. Um, and this idea that both of them would write what looked to be such inconsequential books, primers, school books, the things you begin your learning with. But this is what, this is, to, and it's a wonderful occasion for me to, to make a case for my, the revised edition of Idioms of Improvement, because the, the case I make in Idioms of Improvement is that though these are very modest types of work, these school books, these primers, Barnapuri Choi, Shahojpat, they, they are immensely important for the sort of disciplining of young minds, for the shaping of culture. And so my, my goal in that book was to show how a whole range of school book literature in the colonial era was hugely important and need to be attended to. We tend to think, no, culture takes place at the level of Kalidasa and, and um, Mahabharata and all this great literature, and we don't look at the school books. But both of these men understood that if you're going to transform society, you need to begin with education. And in education, you begin with the very beginning, with the, with the alphabet. Uh, and from there, you begin telling stories. And I think it's that combination of attention to language and facility with storytelling that distinguishes both Vidashagar and, of course, Tagore. Uh, there is a... I'm just asking, so almost one and a half hour. Uh, are yes. you comfortable with taking more questions or shall you call it a day? I, I, I will be grateful to follow your lead. I'm okay for a bit longer, but if I know it's getting late there, and you have no, to. No, it doesn't your... matter. We are enjoying. I'm just asking <laughs> about you because I, I'm for fine. You, I mean, it's more than uh, one and a half hour. So I don't mind if you continue. We take another 10, 15 minutes if you want All or right. something. Okay, okay. Yeah. Shanto, so but... then about three, four questions. Okay. Next, there's a remark from Asha Mukherjee. Being Parumarthik and being Manush are not in conflict for Ravindranath. In fact, he insists on the harmony between the two. Mm. So, being Vidrohi in the sense for Tagore perhaps needs to be looked into. I, I, I agree. And uh, in, in the word harmony that you, that the question, the, the person used in the question, I forget their name. Uh, that's key to, of course, Tagore is the harmonization of these things. And I, I, I tried to make this point, in fact, that being Parmartic does not make him other than fully human. His, his Manushita and his Paramartika, they go together, they're harmonized. Uh, and of course, I think what Rabindranath would be driving at is to say, we shouldn't just put Bidashagar up on a pedestal and we could say, oh, he's a great man and then we can go about our lives. I think he's saying we can be, we can harmonize these values in our own lives. Because otherwise, what would be the point of celebrating a Bidashagar if it couldn't be possible for us to be like him to be Bidrohis in our own way, to where we could bring higher values when those are necessary. And here's, you know, this connects back to the religion issue. Uh, what is the highest value for Bidashagar? It's not Swarga, it's not Moksha, it's not God, Krishna, it's not, it's human life, suffering, and the overcoming of suffering, making a better world. So I think the Paramartha for Vidashagar is right here. These are very much, uh, you know, the, the, the line from, um, is it Chandidas, that there's you know, no higher dharma than humanity. This is, this is true for, for Vidashagar. And I think Tagore, of course, understood the Baal sentiment of the uh, Monaranush, right? The, the man of the heart, that this is, this is the harmony that should take place in all of our lives. The next question, what was the relation between Madhun Mohan, Torkalankar and Vita Shabu? Well, uh, a very close one, both personally and professionally. They were uh, intimately involved in the Sanskrit press and depository. There's some minor 
uh, literature around that relationship and uh, some dispute over uh, the sort of precedence Madan Mohan might deserve in terms of uh, the publication of a text like Anand, Ananda Mangal. You know, Ananda Mangal was, a, by all accounts, a, a text that Bidashak would love, which is, again, a kind of a wonderful thing to remind us of his humanity. It's a vernacular middle Bangla text that's quite uh, earthy, we could say, uh, but also very poetic, very Sanskritic in its Bangla. But he loved this text, and even if he knew it had a bit of adirash, uh, that he was a bit concerned that young people didn't need to be exposed to. But Madan Mohan also uh, was involved with Ananda Mongol. And there's, so there's some minor disputes in the literature around the relative role of the two men in, in making the Sanskrit press a success and bringing out books like Ananda Mongol. I don't, I, I think it's important to pursue the, the evidence where we can find it there. I don't think it will vastly upset our understanding of who Bidashaga was. What I would hope is it would help us. I, for a long time, was really invested in learning is what I could about all these pundits around Vidashagar, the Madan Mohans, the Jaigo Paltark Alankars, the Taranat Tarkabat Shaspatis, this so whole galaxy of Sanskrit scholars in the 19th century who whose names we don't know, but who were doing wonderful things. Madan Mohan was publishing his own poetry, his own school books. So we ought to spend more time learning about these figures because they were part of Vidashagar's world and he was not himself the only thing happening. Uh, how did you become interested in Ishwar Chandra Vidyashagur is what Dr. Sumit Basu wants to know. So it's, it's a great question and I, I, I put it in the, in the presentation rather facetiously, but it's also kind of true. I literally was in Bolpur uh, just poking around shops uh, and in those days, the shops were quite modest. I imagine Bolpur has grown up quite a bit since then. Uh, but I was just went into a bookseller and I saw this Barnapuri Choi and saw Bidda Shagor's image. And I had seen, of course, his image before, no, most notably in Kolkata. You'd see it painted on the wall next to Swami Vivekananda or Bankim Chandra. And so I knew sort of in, incipiently that Bidda Shagor was a major figure in the, we could call the pantheon of the Bangla. Bengal Renaissance, but I didn't really understand that he mattered so much until I saw this little school book. And then I thought, what's this school book? What's its relationship to this man whose picture I saw painted on the wall in Calcutta? And it began uh, from there to, to quickly blossom out. And I, I don't remember when I realized, but fairly shortly you, you come to learn that Tagore, of course, had this immense respect for Bindashagor. And from there I knew I was onto something for me, at least. It was no discovery for any of you, but for me, it was a huge discovery. Um, and it really changed everything because I had come to Shantanikate and expecting to work on Rabindranath. Um, and by the time I returned to the United States and wrote my prospectus for my thesis, it was now about Vidashagar and coming back to Kolkata to do archival research on Vidashagar. So that moment was. And being in Chantanakaden is where it happened. So it's a really wonderful thing. Uh, we are down to the last three for questions. After oh, please. taking any more questions, so I request everyone to please uh, don't uh, ask any more questions. The next question is from Rupak Banerjee in the US. Mm. He wants to know. While Ram Mohan and Vidya Shagor had ideologically similar thinking, are there differences? Well, um, we've touched on one already, I think, uh, and that has to do with the what we could call the spiritual or the religious dimension. Uh, Ram Mohan was clearly much more convinced that it was important to articulate a kind of religious vision for a new India. And this leads to the creation of the Brahmo Samaj and the articulation of Brahmo Dharma, as Devendranath would call it, this idea of there being one God and our brotherhood of humanity in relationship to God 
and the way that that could be extrapolated out of the Upanishads, etc. So that mattered to Ramahan in a way that it just doesn't seem to have mattered to the Dashagar. And from there, we could say maybe Ramahan felt the reformation of religion was the be beginning of the way to change society. Whereas Bidashagar, again, doesn't seem to think that if society's cha to change, we have to reform religion so much as we simply have to begin changing our practices, our customs, our achara, um, even though he uses the Shastra. So there's a, there's a similarity there that both Vidashagar and Ramohan are Shast I would call them Shastric reformers. They have a vision of modernity that can be in their minds reconciled with classical Indian learning as it's found in the Shastras. So uh, both of them look to the past and the great texts of the tradition to change society, but one of them does it in a religious modality and the other one pursues it more in terms of uh, social the structures and um, practices at the social level. There is an earlier question and uh, from Anunna Dr. Gupta and now she's asking. Hmm. I do see your point. I was wondering if you would say the fact of seeing suffering as empirical reality and the objectivity that it imparts is the foundational premise for a reformist program. I, I wouldn't argue with it as being uh, foundational. Um, I don't, again, I'm not sure if that's uh, meant to be a more on, on a, a normative level or a descriptive level. So that is, uh, should a program always begin with the identification of suffering or could it, could it identify other forms of it, we can also quibble over what we mean by suffering there. It could be other forms of lack. Uh, so if people are uh, in lack of certain kinds of education, is that, a, is that suffering? They may not be suffering. They may not be hungry. They may not be suffering from cold, but they may be uh, lacking knowledge. So we could keep people bellies full and their houses warm, but we wouldn't educate them. That would, uh, that would be a problem. So it might not always be suffering, but again, if we define suffering broadly enough, you might say lack of learning is a mode of suffering. Um, so I don't, again, we could get into semantics, but I, I take the question's force that it's certainly seeing that something is amiss. Maybe, maybe we go back to Siddhartha Gautama, the Buddha, I think of Dukkha. Dukkha is perception of things being amiss. So suffering may be too narrow a way to, to understand Dukkha, but if dukkha means the world is out of joint, things are not as they should be, then yes, perception of, of um, dukkha is fundamental to the idea to then begin changing reality. Thank you, all our participants, <laughs> and of course, you all. Dr. Hatcher, for a really engrossing evening of uh, presentation. It was a delight to hear you, sir, and we do hope to have you again amidst us. I hope so. I hope so. Virtually, if not <laughs> spiritually. I hope physically we can we can meet in, in Shantani Kaden. So Brian, before you, you know, conclude the session, you know, let me express mm -hmm. my personal gratitude to you. And as I, you know, keep saying, uh, Shantani Ketan is a family. Mm. And, you know, given your interest in uh, uh, Rabindranath Tagore and given your interest in Bolpur, I mean, we welcome you to our family. So from today onwards, you know, you will no longer be a family of Tufts University, but <laughs> Thank you. Is that, is that accepted? Absolutely accepted oh, with thank pleasure. Thank you very much. Yes. And, and Brian, I think, you know, uh, I'm, I'm really quite intrigued by some of the observations which you have made. I mean, I'm not an expert on either Vidyashagar or Rabindranath, but, you know, after having joined Vishwavarti in 2019, um, mm. 2018, sorry, 2018 November, almost two years, I've just passed two years, I mean, finished two years of 
my tenure of five years. And, you know, I thought that I must do something on Tagore. And, mm -hmm. you know, my basic training is in political science. So I, I wanted to write a book on his socio-political ideals. Yes. And you know, recently, you know, Sage has published that book. I mean, I haven't got the book yet, but I'm told <laughs> the book is in the market now. So, you know, there, while working on uh, that particular book, I found out this Charitra Puja, that particular text, you know, it's a booklet, basically, mm. is very useful to understand how did Tagore view uh, individuals, uh, I mean, prominent individuals of, a, of his, of uh, the, the kind of social, economic, and political environment in which he thrived. But also the ideas, you know, the, the mm. liberal ideas, you know, the ideas of enlightenment, um, sure. which um, uh, just started pouring in in India at that point of time. Mm. And Tagore, as is, uh, uh, I'm sure you'll agree with me, was a Renaissance man. So mm. being a Renaissance man, he always welcomed you know, these ideas. Uh, and the, I, I think, you know, he talked about uh, Bidashagur, Ram Mohan and his father, simply because they are also... Um, appreciative of these um, enlightened uh, ideas and uh, uh, it's quite surprising that you know, he didn't talk about anybody else though there are many uh, I mean you mm. name uh, some of the tall intellectuals of that particular period with the entire Brahma Shamat, you know mm. had so many uh, luminaries yet yeah. they go focus on the um, uh, you know uh, Ram Mohan and his father and uh, Vidyashagor so I think mm. you know that shows probably that um, Tagore was inspired by their ideas simply because their ideas corresponded with what Tagore represented. And yeah. here, I think I, I reduce uh, my argument to one particular, you know, broad or prominent European ideas, the idea of enlightenment. Mm -hmm. And enlightenment, you know, it, uh, when it talks about enlightenment, it, uh, to me, it connotes care, compassion and concern. So I think you know these three characters, which he referred to and he elaborated also in Charitra Puja, uh, represented the values which uh, Enlightenment represented. So I, I, I mean, this is my kind of you know off the cuff kind of comment. But as I said, I mean, you are an expert, and I, I really enjoyed uh, listening to your lecture. And you know, I think uh, I, I'm a little provoked now to <laughs> write a book on more or less you know following your kind of argument that mm. how did uh, Tagore uh, view or rather conceptualize, you know, Vidya Shagor's um, ideas, because most of us, uh, uh, as you said, he is very popular. He is very popular because Borno Purichai is the, the first book, you know, which were introduced to um, from childhood. So everybody, mm. you know, in my, uh, starting from my grandfather uh, till my son, um, everybody starts mm -hmm. uh, doing Bengali. Uh, yeah. From Borno Puruja. Even Shahuj part, the Tagore's text, you know, it, it came to the market. I mean, initially, there are many people who started, you know, kind of pampering that particular text, but somehow or the other, it didn't really take off. Yeah. Uh, while Borno Puruja, you know, continues to remain uh, one of the most, you know, popular texts among those who are learning Bengali. I mean, I, I mean it, it also confirms that when you went to a Bolpur bookshop, you didn't get, <laughs> uh, you didn't yeah. try to look for Tagore's. Uh, the the primers, but yeah. you, you found out Borno Purija. So that also mm -hmm. uh, you know, confirms my point that Borno mm -hmm. Purija is a seminal, uh, is a seminal text for all those who are trying to learn Bengali. So mm -hmm. I think you know that that's one side of Vidyashagar. But you know after Ashok Sen's famous book, The Milestone, mm -hmm. and um, uh, I mean your um, kind of you know very seminal work on Vidyashagar, and after having read Charitra Puja, I think Tagore. And Vidyashagor uh, can be placed under one particular platform simply because their socio-political aims remain the same. I mean, Vidyashagor was a very orthodox Brahmin. I mean, he started with the first slide that he was a professor of Sanskrit College, was very reluctant to teach the Shudras. Mm. He was the one who uh, talked about um, uh, the servants uh, should be obedient to their masters, you know, in his mm. niti both. And mm. yet, this is the person who really raised his voice against uh, widow uh, remarriage, uh, widow mm. marriage, and you know, the, the, the kind of you know, the pernicious orthodox uh, practices uh, that appeared to have affected Bengali society adversely. And I'll give you a very interesting kind of data 
you know, I, I did a little bit of research on this uh, Vidhava Vivaho episode, um, uh, which uh, Vidhasagar pursued quite seriously. You know, if, if you look at uh, some of the data, you'll find Raja, you know, Radhakanto Dev, who was one of the prominent Bengalis of um, the 19th century, he was opposed to um, Vidhasagar and he collected um, approximately 37,000 signatures. You know, mm. or those who uh, those who challenged with Dashagor in this regard and sent mm. that to the um, uh, to the British Parliament. Mm. And you know, again, interestingly, those who supported with Dashagor were not Bengalis. You know, most of them <laughs> they came from Pune and yeah. and um, and Mysore. And you know, if you count the signatures in support of widow remarriage, you you will be very disappointed. Uh, I found only there are two hundred and thirty seven signatures. Who supported mm. Vidya Shagor in this, you know, grand mission? So you yeah. know that that shows that even in that particular context, the the sort of mission which Vidya Shagor had was not really appreciated by all, and the Orthodox people, no. you know, they didn't no. support it. And you know, I mean, this is now interpreted by Partho Charaji that you know the Orthodox Bengali didn't support it not because they were illiberal, not because mm. they were Orthodox or opposed to uh, widow remarriage, but they didn't want. The British colonialism to get into inner, you know, self, inner That's circle right. of uh, Indian society or inner circle of inner uh, Indian psyche. I mean, mm. I don't know whether that's uh, plausible or not. You must have read about it in the part yes. we talked about yes. in the fragments, yes. the yes. fragments of yes. nation. Um, and, and as you know, uh, I mean, Tilak also opposed um, yeah. Uh, yeah. a very radical kind of legislation, the Age of Consent Bill in 1893. Yes. So I think you know Partho collects all these evidences to argue that um, the, he, the 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 nationalists didn't want the British colonialism to get into home or the mm. what is the spiritual war of India. Uh, yes. You know that's one uh, way of looking at things. But you know the Brian, I think as I said, uh, not uh, not as vice chancellor, but as a kind of <laughs> fellow academic, you know, who huh. follow the same kind of path. We are really, really, really grateful to you. And uh -huh. as a family member, I'm inviting <laughs> you to come physically to uh -huh. Vishwa Bharati. So I think I would expect that whenever you are allowed to take the flight away from uh -huh. the United States, your first landing station will be Shantini Ketan. Right? <laughs> Next choice. So I think, Next choice. You know, that's, that's the kind of award and I really thank you. Uh, we are thank really you. grateful to you uh, that you gave. Thank but you. You know, I'll keep bothering you. Um, <laughs> please, you know, I would please. like to have one lecture by you, you know, at your convenience on Hinduism uh, before reform. Because, you know, Ram Mohan and Dhyanand Saraswati, they are my really you know, favorite icons. Nah. Recently, I published a book on Hindu nationalism in India. Uh, Routledge okay. published it this year. I don't know whether mm. you saw the book. I've not and, seen that, no. And there, there I talked about Dhyanand Saraswati, Satyartha Prakash. And I have okay. great nah. respect for this, you know, uh, saint come social reformer. So mm. I think, you know, if you have, just give us time according to your convenience, probably next year, yes. I would like to have a lecture by you on this particular book published in 2020. Yes, Thank you that's... very much. And you know, have a great lunch. And I think <laughs> Thank you have you. Uh, uh, dinner. Thanks a lot. You go have dinner. So <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you. you for this. It's my Thank pleasure. You. Okay, okay. Have Sure. Have Have a আ নিশ্চয় আসব আপনি আসবেন এবং আমি যেটা বললাম যখনই ফ্লাইটের ডিসিশন হোয়েন ইউ টেক দ্য ডিসিশন টু কাম আউট অফ দ্য ইউনাইটেড স্টেটস আই থিং উই উড লাইক টু হ্যাভ ইওর ফার্স্ট ল্যান্ডিং স্টেশন এট বিশ্বভারত আচ্ছা আই উইল ডু দ্যাট थैंक यू सर দ্য ব্রায়ান ইওর কোলিগ ফর্মার কোলিগ সুগত ইজ মাই ব্যাচমেট ইন ফ্যাসিলিটি কলেজ यस সুগত ইজ ইন হার্ভার্ড নাও and then my... Aisha. Aisha also, I know Aisha, Aisha. because uh, when yes. they were doing PhD uh, at Cambridge um, at St. Katz, I was at the London School of Economics. Acha. And uh, I also worked on the you know, middle class radicalism and uh, uh, political ideology, middle class radicalism in Bengal in the 20s and 30s, mm. uh, mainly focusing on Shubhas Chandra Bose. Acha. So, um, and that time, Shugato was doing that book on Agrida and Bengal. Very and Aisha Bengal. was working on uh, the sole spokesman. Well, so, let me uh, tell you uh, one thing, just to think of how the world is connected. Shugato has a student now whose name is Oniket. He's from Howrah. He, uh, he was my student at 
Tufts, came to Tufts oh. from, from Howrah, now is doing a PhD under Shugato at Harvard. So the world is a very small place very now. Small, and, uh, very small, very small. We're all connected. It's a wonderful thing. Yes, we're thing. all connected. And thanks a lot. And uh, please, you know, um, give us interesting thoughts, you know, to enlighten us. You please and keep we'll in touch. we'll be in touch. We'll be yes, in touch. absolutely. Thank you, My Brian. My best to everyone there. Namaskar. Thank you. Namaskar. Thank you. Okay, then. We are, we are closing the session. Okay, thank you. Okay. Good night. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Shanta Vandakurada.